I'm going to start with is the topic, but more importantly, me. <laughs> me. It is all about me, after all. So this was me at the age of six. And while you can tell from this picture that my bangs were really on straight, as was my hair, because I had a mother who insisted on cutting our hair, and she wasn't very good at it. <laughs> so consequently, she would keep cutting and cutting and cutting until she either got some proximity of straight or we had no more hair to cut off. <laughs> what you can't tell from this picture is that I was tiny for my age. I mean, really small. I was a good head shorter than all the other kids in my class. But what I lacked in stature, I have to tell you, I made up for in mighty. <laughs> now by mighty, I'm gonna be more specific. I was extremely bossy. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you my nickname, Bossy Pants. Aww. And I wore those pants every single day and proudly. As an example, you know, I lived when I was little at a time when we didn't have video games. That may be true for some of you, but you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> and when we didn't have active summer activities. So we played outside all day long, all day long. And because of that, all the neighborhood kids would gather at our house in the morning, and they would stand in the front yard, and they would look at me, and they would wait for me to say, let's pretend. And then they would let me either pick the game we were gonna play, like kick the can. I don't know if anybody remembers kick the can. It's pretty dated. Or some adventure we were gonna play out, whether it was pirates on the high seas, or it was family desert on a desert island, or Rapunzel. And not only would they let me pick the game, they let me assign each and every role. Can you believe it? They let me. And because of that, I'm sure you're shocked to hear that my younger sister, who was the youngest of all of them, is still my best friend. Particularly shocked when you hear what I asked her to do. My little sister was only ever given one of two roles, either that of baby, and I told her, this is what a baby looks like, which she did nicely all day long. I don't know why I thought that that's what babies look like, but I did. Or she got to be the dog, <laughs> which it meant she had to wag her tail all day long. And yet we're still friends. So given this, you might think, you know what? That story's really cute for a six-year-old. Not so cute for this adult I'd like to think of myself as a grown woman you see before you. Perhaps bossy is just not nearly as attractive. It's not nearly as effective. It's not nearly as respected when you're an adult, but only when you're a child. The problem is I'm equally bossy today, and that's the truth. But, you know, for many of us, as you've heard, bossy has become a bad word, particularly as it relates to little girls. As a matter of fact, not only do many people view bossy as a bad word, but I'm gonna use an example from an exceptional, extraordinary woman, Sheryl Sandberg, as many of you know, who's the COO at Facebook and the founder of the Lean In Movement. And she said, and I quote, if we want girls to receive position, positive reinforcement for early acts of leadership, let's discourage bossy behavior, along with banning bossy labels. That means teaching girls to engage in behavior that earns admiration before they assert their authority. Very wise, don't you think? The only problem for me, it is the antithesis of what my own mother taught me. So this is my mom. She would have preferred me to give a younger picture, so I did. <laughs> and unlike the extraordinary <coughs> Sheryl Sandberg, my mother taught me the following. She taught me that the benefits of being constructively bossy greatly outweigh the costs of sitting politely on the sideline. And that's how I've lived my life. That's how I've lived my life, most days anyway. So the question I pose for you is who's right? The extraordinary Sheryl Sandberg or my mom? So I pose to you, does the cost or pay, does it cost or pay for women and girls to be bossy? 
beneficial or costly? Now, given the fact that my title as a child was bossy pants, it may not surprise you to realize that my area of expertise has begun, become negotiation. It's a natural for me. And I have, as a result of that, had the opportunity to do research with world-renowned scholars and to work with companies like many of yours worldwide. And I've learned a lot during that time. But one of the most important things I've learned is that negotiation is not just something that happens in a business setting with concrete issues at a pre-specified time. It's a philosophy of interpersonal exchange. I'm going to say that again. It's a philosophy of interpersonal exchange. And what I mean by that, it is your belief system about the process you should use for dealing with conflict, for distributing resources, and for making decisions with others, right? As such, what that means is each and every one of you is negotiating all day, every day. Whether that negotiation involves getting your two-year-old to go to bed on time, your teenager, and this one's hard, to meet the per curfew, a significant other to take your child to the doctor and take the day off instead of you, an elderly parent to give up their car after a lifetime of mobility, whether it involves your sales negotiations, procurement, whether it involves negotiating with your employees or employers, it's all negotiation. So I would argue that the most effective negotiators tend to be successful people and the most successful uh, people tend to be effective negotiators, which brings us to the question that I want to pose to you, and that is, do you believe, do you believe there are gender differences in negotiation? Raise your hand if you do. Put them high. We'll look around. Almost everybody in this room raised their hand, and luckily for you, those who did are right. What we know from the excellent work of many of my colleagues, including Babcock, Bear, Bowles Rally, Gelfand, Kennedy, Cray, and many others, is that there are profound differences in the way that men and women negotiate. As a matter of fact, we know that women are far less likely to share their opinions. We know that they're less likely to negotiate, particularly when they perceive the context as a formal negotiation. We know that when they do negotiate, they're far less likely to provide the first offer, and if they do, extreme first offers, and they're much less persistent and assertive in negotiation. Given that I just said effective people are successful negotiators and successful people are effective, right? Guess what? We need to think about this. Now, having said that, I want to tell you this starts at a very, very early age, at this wonderful 2020 segment some time ago. They had a developmental psychologist who came in. And what she did was she wanted to display how early gender differences surfaced. So they did something called the lemonade stand experiment. They set up this beautiful little lemonade stand and they put this gorgeous pitcher of lemonade on the table. And then they invited little girls and boys to taste it. The issue was, instead of putting sugar in it like almost all of our recipes call for, guess what? They replaced the sugar with copious amounts of salt. So you can imagine what that lemonade tasted like. And then they invited little girls and little boys to taste it. Do you think there were differences? Of course there were. So what about the little girls? How do you think they reacted? Listen to you. Mmm, that tastes good. As a matter of fact, one little girl asked for the recipe. <laughs> and the boys, how do you think they reacted? <laughs> Yuck, this is terrible. And some of them spit it on the ground with exaggeration. So these differences start very, very early, okay? But guess what? They don't end with childhood. They progress into our adulthood. Very recently, some of my colleagues and I did research on CEOs. Now, let's face it, there is no CEO who can be effective if they are not effective negotiators. This is basically what they do for a living, correct? So what we did first was we found out all the tasks that CEOs see themselves doing. <coughs> Interacting with board members, working with employees, 
dealing with the external community, figuring out funding distributions, all of the tasks the CEOs do. And then we looked at the extent to which they were competent negotiators in those tasks and their level of confidence in those tasks. And what we found was there were no differences whatsoever in their ability to negotiate, but there was a profound difference in their confidence in their ability to negotiate. As a matter of fact, when we describe those tasks, simply leaving the word negotiation out of it, women told us they did them as often and as well as their male counterparts. However, when all we did was add the word negotiation, they told us they did it far less often and far less well. So this belief system continues well into adulthood and with the most successful among us. Now that brings me to you. I have a question for you. How many of you negotiated your first job offer? Raise your hands high. Now we see very different numbers in the audience than we did earlier, correct? Very, very few of you. How many of you have renegotiated your job? We see more, but we still see a real minority. Okay, so let's talk about that. My colleague, Linda Babcock, and her co-author in an excellent book called Women Don't Ask, provided an excellent example of what we discovered when we researched our book, Get Paid What You're Worth. What we found were very big differences between the amount of women who negotiated salary and compensation and the number of men. But she provided an excellent example of the consequences of those choices. So let me give you a scenario. Two people, age of 30, receive an offer from a company for ADK and they're equally qualified. Jen accepts the offer as provided with her things. David instead negotiates for a very slight increase, 1%. Now, one thing you should know is that most people who negotiate their salary and compensation increase their salary by on average seven to 10%. So this is the most extreme example I can give you. So all the difference is, is less than 1% difference in what they negotiated. Having said that, okay, they both receive equivalent assessments every year and therefore a raise of 5%. At the age of 65, how long do you think Jen will have to work longer than David to accumulate the same amount in salary and compensation in her lifetime? Seven years, anybody else? Okay, you guys are right in between, perfect example, nine years longer. Nine years longer. Now I know some of you in the audience probably hope to retire by 65. Would you rather retire at 74? I wouldn't. Now, let me tell you there's a lot more to this story. We know that starting salaries give all kinds of cues to the marketplace and have perpetuating impact. What's the first thing new companies ask you for when you're on the market? Market salary information, right? What is your salary history? And they ask you for two reasons. They ask you first and foremost because guess what? They want to know how much to pay you. But not only that, they're comparing you to others in the market. If you negotiate and someone doesn't, who looks better in the market? You do. So consequently, it has an impact on the next salary you obtain. In addition, salary increases are also influenced each and every year. You would think if two people started out differently and you, your performance was the same, what would happen? You would catch up, correct? That's not what happens. It's a simple heuristic for companies to use. So the person who started less tends to get incrementally increasing less than the person who negotiated. Very profound impact. In addition, it influences your advancement throughout your career because many of the skills that our companies or organizations are looking for are those that deal with negotiation. So given that, okay, we want to consider the fact that, you know, four times as many men negotiate salary compensation than women. Four times as many. And we look at the amount that they negotiate, those who do versus those who don't, Guess what? It completely explains inequity in salary histories. So let me give you a more realistic example. Given everything I've just told you, 
if the raise difference for Jen and David is 1% a year, how much longer do you think Jen's going to have to work than David to end up with the same amount at the end of her career? 47 years. And now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to work till I'm 112. And I don't expect to live that long. So even if I wanted to, I probably couldn't. So what that says is, this is crucial even without switching jobs. Think of the continual impact of switching jobs in addition. Now, it doesn't just happen at, at work. This also has a carryover effect to our homes, and you know it, right? Recent research showed that among married dual career households, a woman on average spent, and I think this is an underestimation, an extra hour per day on family-related tasks. Don't you agree that's an underestimation? <laughs> OK. But when we carry that out, what that tells us is that's 364 more hours a year. And in a career of 35 years, it is over 4.4 years of added time. At a time you're not spending on other things like work, spas, <laughs> relaxation, and lots of other things that we should be spending our time doing. So my argument is you are doomed if you do not negotiate assertively. Doomed in every aspect of your life. OK, that's a big word. But I still mean it, doomed if you don't negotiate. <laughs> so the question is, why don't more women negotiate sovereign compensation? You know the answer. The answer is they're afraid of the B words. And by B, I mean, what did I just say, bossy? And what does bossy translate into? You know what you're thinking. <laughs> Bitchy. And what do you think that translates into? Because you've been told it does. Backlash, correct? Negative reactions in terms of liking, negative reactions in terms of respect, and as a consequence, guess what? You won't do as well as work. How many of you have heard that? Yeah, OK. Well, that would mean you're damned if you do negotiate assertively. So see the, the paradox? Doomed if you don't, damned if you do? It's a huge paradox. Well, I'm here to tell you it's hogwash. Absolute hogwash. And the reason it's hogwash is our belief about backlash for women in assertive settings is outdated. And in addition, that data was collected, guess what, with populations of undergraduate students. Undergraduate students who had no relationship with the people hired would no have implications for the person hired and simply made simple statements and effects. So we redid this research and we looked more carefully at what people mean by assertive, passive, and aggressive. And we looked at the differences for men and women. So we let people tell us what that behavior looked like in negotiation. And then we sampled adults, people like those in this audience. And this is what we found for passive behavior. Passive strategies decrease your own benefit. Guess what? You've taken what they offered you. You're not in any way, shape, or form increasing the benefit you obtain. But more than that, it also decreases the outcome to the other side. And the reason it does is because, guess what? You're not working further to pursue your goals and therefore finding out ways to give them something in return for what you want. In addition, they may like you, but they don't respect you. There are loss in terms of respect. Assertive behavior increases your own outcomes significantly. But it also, for the reasons I just told you, increases the benefit to the other side. And more than that, guess what? It increases liking and respect, both, for both men and women. Aggressive strategies now. Do you think there are gender differences? Do you think women are penalized more than men? This is what we found. We found that, guess what? Aggressive strategies produce a decrease in liking for men and women. But what's interesting is men were liked less who were aggressive than were women. Men were like less who were aggressive than were women. As a matter of fact, they received the most backlash. But you know what it is about us women? We feel it more, don't we? We internalize it more, don't we? And you know we do. Think about two little kids playing. When the little girl gets hit, what does she do? Cries, sobs. When the little boy gets hit, what does he do? He punches back. So let me tell you what I'm really arguing here. 
What I'm arguing, I'm not saying we don't want our girls and boys to be nice. My son's in the audience, I want him to be nice, okay? Certainly, sugar is needed if we're gonna make lemonade, but so is lemon and the willingness to stir the pot, correct? The whole package. We need diplomacy and directness, all of us, not just our men, not just our women. And one of the things to keep in mind is we as women and as men need to learn how to take a verbal punch. Because guess what? Life is about positive and negative feedback. Life is about resistance as well as non-resistance. Now, so what's my advice for women? The following. First of all, don't overestimate the cost of backlash. Backlash is decreasing your willingness to be assertive exactly when we need you to be assertive. Secondly, the most effective negotiators in the world are androgynous, meaning they keep an eye on the prize and what they're trying to achieve without feeling like they need to apologize. But they also have the capacity to connect, to hear, to empathize, right? Can you do one alone? No, we can do both. As a matter of fact, guess what? You are unidimensional. You're not, you're a multidimensional, not unidimensional. You're not either just nice or just assertive. You're all of those things. And guess what? Different situations require different amounts of each. In addition, I've learned in negotiation, there is nothing more powerful than a steel fist in a velvet glove. And you know it too. So, what are my bossiness rules? Know what you want and ask for it. Even at Christmas time, if you don't tell people what you want, you're not finding it under the tree. <laughs> and they'll thank you for it so they don't have to search, right? Know your boundaries and recognize those of others. When you're faced with a boundary, don't break it. Ask the whys and why not so you really understand why it's there and whether there are ways to fulfill that need without passing the boundary. Respect yourself and others and expect and demand respect in return. <laughs> Don't take things personally. This is a really hard one for us. Very hard for us. We take everything to heart. Most of what's going on with other people is going on with other people and has nothing to do with you. Don't bottle up your feelings. They come out in one of two ways, either health issues, or you hold it in and hold it in and hold it in and then what do you do? Explode. And typically at times when people didn't expect it or it's not appropriate. Say what you're going to do and do what you say you will. Be impeccable with your word. And the last one is pick your battles. If you fight every battle, even those that can't be won or shouldn't be fought, people will stop listening to you. So in conclusion, let me tell you, I'm arguing we shouldn't stop calling girls bossy. It's sending the wrong message. It's telling them there's something wrong with being bossy. Bossy is an important skill. It's an important component of who we are and how we interact with others. Instead, we should teach them to embrace and live the benefits of bossy. You know, the truth is you can't be a bossy if you won't be proud to be bossy. You know how hard it is to change the world. And most of my colleagues are calling on organizations to create pay equity. Do you know how long we will wait for that? Probably longer than I live. It is really hard to change the world. It is far easier to change yourself. To be accountable and responsible and create your own existence. If every one of us agrees to change ourselves and change our children and change our friends and change our colleagues, what will we have done? We will have changed the world, correct? All right, so if you are ready to be bossy, stand up, but only if you mean it. All right, let me hear it. Bossy, bossy, bossy. Thank you.